Well, I'm glad you all joined me here today. I see that you have your backpacks on, your comfy shoes, your hats, your sunscreen, and your hiking sticks. So we're ready to start out on the trail today. We have some rules, though, on this trail today. As we walk along, if you trip over anything, you have to pick it up and stick it in your backpack, okay? And we'll see who makes it to the end. Well, now, wouldn't it be funny if that's actually how life was? If as we walked along, we stumbled over the rocks, the stumbling blocks, if you will, and we had to pick them up and carry them along with us? Well, that would just be crazy, wouldn't it? If we actually had to do that on a hike? And yet, how many of us try to do that in our daily lives? We pick up the stumbling blocks that cause us to fail, and we carry them with us. Guilt is something, basically it's an anxiety, it's a feeling that we have when we feel that we've done something wrong. And we will carry that with us and carry it around with us. Now some can be overwhelmed by guilt to the point of it affecting their physical bodies. They can become ill, they can find it just impossible to carry on with their lives because they're so overcome by feelings of guilt. They'll Basically they're, they'll break down, they'll have an emotional breakdown and be just unable to function. And yet others, we've probably known a few of these, unfortunately, people who just don't seem to be bothered at all by much of anything that they might do, no matter how terrible it might seem to us or even by any standards that any others would live by. They just It doesn't seem to bother them. So why do we experience guilt? What What's it all about? What is this thing that is guilt? The idea of hiking got my nose running, so excuse me. You know, why do we experience this guilt? Well, to start with, it's basically developed in our childhood. You know, our families have certain values, don't do this, do do that. And whether or not those are verbalized or merely as a result of the actions of our parents or those around us or, or the society we live in, those things get ingrained into us, those feelings of good and bad, of good and evil, of right and wrong. They become a part of who we are just naturally, no matter what we do. You know, if our parents approve of something, then, well, that's a good thing, and so we want to do that again. If they disapprove, then, oh, we don't want to do that again. And there's no real, we're not applying any measurement to whatever those things are. Just the only measure is how people respond to them, and we learn from those things what is good and what is bad. And sometimes, unfortunately, things that aren't even our own fault, we feel guilty for. We'll hear of, in cases of, unfortunately, of abuse, where the one who is abused feels guilty for being abused. So where do those feelings come from? Well, they come from our environment. We can be manipulated by advertisements to feel guilty. Husbands and wives want to buy expensive things they can't afford because, well, every kiss begins with K, after all. You know, you see the ads on the on the TV for those hungry kids, and oh, the guilt just overwhelms you, and you write a big check. It's it's something we live with all the time. Today, in this sermon titled "Leaving Guilt Behind," I'd like to examine the source of guilt and how we can grow from it and move beyond it. This is based on several articles that I picked up on UCG.org when I looked at repentance and guilt. So the question is, who decides what's right and wrong? Well, again, as we were talking about guilt and where it came from, the guilt is basically a function of our conscience. Our conscience tells us that's right or that's wrong, and we respond to that feeling. And again, it's naturally developed as a mixture of all kinds of things, kind of a jumbled mixture of society and our religion and our family values or lack thereof our education, and the background that our family you know, brings to the page. What we really need, though, instead of this confusing mix of social pressures or whatever you want to call them, what we really need is an absolute, don't we? We need to know where we are, what is right and what is wrong. Because if we're feeling guilty about doing right things, well, that's kind of silly. And if we're not feeling guilty about doing wrong things, then there's a problem. So we really need this definition. A lot of the people in the world actually use the Bible. And if you'll turn to John chapter 8 with me, let's look at one of the areas where they look at to as a definition of right and wrong. And let's see how they, how they apply it. And John 8, some of you already know, is we'll find the story of the woman caught in adultery. 
And if you start, we'll, we'll go to chapter three, or I'm sorry, verse three, chapter of chapter eight of John. And the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery, and they set her in the midst. Now again, as I stated, it's a very popular story. This woman was caught in adultery. She was guilty of this crime. The Ten Commandments condemned the sin very clearly, yes. I think we'd all agree with that, particularly here in this room. And these men, according to the standards of their society, felt they had were within their rights to stone her for her adultery. It's interesting that no mention of the man caught in adultery, but they had this woman, they'd caught her, and they were going to make an example out of her. And Jesus Christ saw an opportunity to teach them something. And he said to them in verse 7, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And they all disappeared because they were convicted by their own consciousness of their own guilt, of the sin. Now the rest of the world, popular Christianity stops here. They just take this and say, well, hey, you know, apparently there are no standards. So she didn't need to be punished. You know, and so there's nothing right or wrong. And what that's what they try to see there. And how often has some, have some very terrible things been basically approved by this, by looking at it this way, you know, well, oh, I was caught in adultery, but that's, you know, you can't punish me for that because it's, there's no standards. You know, Christ said you shouldn't throw any stones at anybody. Well, what about theft or cheating or lying? Well, all kinds of things have been excused by just stopping there. And that reasoning basically says that God's forgiveness erases guilt and all the standards of right and wrong. No standards, no sin, no judging. I feel good about myself. Do you feel good about yourself? Because that's great. No standards at all. I mean, we can get away with anything we want. And they absolutely ignore Jesus Christ's last words to the woman. Jesus Christ taught standards of right and wrong. Right here, verse 11. What does he say? Basically, he says, do right and stop doing wrong. Which means there's a definition of right and wrong. She knew what it was. Jesus Christ knew what it was. And he was telling her, stop doing that and do what's right. And I, of course, I'm paraphrasing. God's forgiveness does not erase our responsibility to know the difference between good and evil. Absolutely not. We must know the difference and we must do the good. God's forgiveness can cleanse our minds of wrong thinking so that we can learn to think correctly, so that we can learn to act correctly, and we can have a better life. So if you want a better life, what do you do? do you, does anybody here want a better life? Nobody? Okay, never mind. Oh, well, there's a couple. A couple people want a better life. Okay, a your be way to get a better life, stop doing wrong and do right. Accept the fact that you've committed crimes against God. Accept that fact and that you're guilty of them. You know, they go to prison sometimes and they talk to people, why are you here? Well, the, you know, the judge had it in for me, the cop, he was dirty. It's always somebody else's fault. And all of us want to make it somebody else's fault. But when we accept the fact that we're individually guilty of our sins, that we are guilty not of so much of hurting other people, but of actually hurting God, of basically spitting on God and harming Him, if we will accept that fact and recognize it and come to him and ask for his forgiveness, that we've made the first most important steps towards being healed, towards having a better life. We need God's forgiveness to have a better life, to live better. And yet instead, what so many people do is they plea bargain with God. You know, oh, yeah, I'm sure I've done a few wrong things, but I'm not as bad as that guy over there. I mean, I haven't done what he did or she did. I'm not so bad, right? You know, it's, it's not so bad. What's the flaw in that thinking? Well, here's the thought. If you're ever ca commit, caught for a crime here, go before the judge and just say, Hey, I didn't murder anybody. You know, it's just armed robbery, no big deal. Come on, let me off. That's not going to happen. You know, you're still guilty of a crime. But we need, if we go to God and we ask for, we, could, we tell him, I did this. I'm sorry and I don't want to do this anymore. Please help me to change. God will provide that, that help. You know, we have no defense. 
for our behaviors. We are guilty and we are subject to that penalty. Without God's forgiveness, we would be subject to that penalty, which is death. And again, we have to ask God for forgiveness in order to have forgiveness. We must admit our guilt, admit to breaking his standards, which is what repentance is. Now, once we've done that, we need to leave the guilt behind. You don't have to carry it. You know, God's not some big scorekeeper with a big card, and over here he goes, okay, that was pretty good. Let me mark one down for on the good side. And, oh, yeah, wasn't so bad. Well, but that's, you know, it's like it's not the scale. We've seen the scales of justice where they balance out good and evil, you know. Oh, you've got a lot of good stuff over here, so it overbalances the bad stuff. That's not what God's doing. He's not keeping track. He's not racking it up on some eternal scorecard that isn't going to go away, that's always going to be there for you. The actual, actually, the record of, that, of those sins is completely erased and destroyed. It doesn't exist anymore. When we confess our sins, when we repent and we ask for God's forgiveness, as it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. You know, good deeds, it doesn't matter all what we do that's good. It's not going to repay God for forgiveness or for cleansing from guilt. Those are just things we have to do. That's a requirement of our service, of our calling, to do the best that we can. And we shouldn't expect to get patted on, you know, pat on the back for being good kids because that's our responsibility. That's what we're supposed to do. God said, hey, I will forgive you. I just expect you to behave yourself. Oh, hey, I'm so good. Give me a lollipop. No, come on. This is what you're expected to do. This is a part of being in the family of God. You are supposed to do what's, what is good and what's best. Now, again, we get back to guilt. It's normal to feel guilt. And it's absolutely true that the pain of past things will, carry, will go with us. We'll feel the pain. You know, if we don't, maybe there's something a little bit wrong with us. But we don't want to hold on to that guilt as, as a way of punishing ourselves. It's not to hold us down or to press us into the ground or to or make us feel inferior or or to develop bitterness about how unfortunately how terrible we are. I'm so bad. I'll never be any good. Woe is me. I'm just so horrible. How could God forgive me? And yet if we repent, if we truly put it in God's hands, we have no need to feel that guilt. Well, unless we sin again. And then we can repent. We can turn back to him again. Because God's mercy is infinite. He is willing to apply that sacrifice of Christ so long as we are trying so, as hard as we can. We're doing the best that we can. If we're, we don't want, certainly don't want to rush into sin so that we can have God's mercy applied to us. And I don't have to go into where the Bible teaches all that. But we do want to do the best that we can. And when we slip, when we trip over the rock, Acknowledge that we tripped and move on past the rock. Let's turn now to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. It tells us how we should feel as we come to God, as we are coming to Him with our, our sins, as we're, we're admitting them to Him. Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 22. This is what should be our focus. Hebrews 10, 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Now that's not to say that the conscience is evil. That's to say that carrying around the guilt is the evil. If we allow our conscience to hold on to that to what we've done, to that guilt that we felt that led us to repent, that led us back to God, then we are, our conscience becomes kind of impure and it, it uh, brings us down. And we don't want to do that. We need to let go of those feelings. A clear conscience is one of the most wonderful gifts that God gives to his children. That comes from the repentance. It comes from God applying that sacrifice. If we turn over to Acts 13.22... We'll find King David mentioned, and it says there that he was a man after God's own heart. Now, does anybody here think David was perfect? Have you read some of the things that David did? 
pretty terrible. Let's face it, he had somebody murdered. He committed adultery. And then I've always found it interesting that the woman he committed adultery with, who became his wife, the child that they had became the next king. Just something to consider. I don't know what it means exactly, but it's interesting to me that through this terrible, damaging act, this king came from it. The next king of Israel came from it. Now, whether the fact that his, his kingship ended up the way it did, I don't know if that's related, but it's just interesting to me that God worked through that. Even in that terrible thing, he found some good in it, that he could find some good in it. Now, David strove to prevent sin from separating him from God. In various places in the Psalms, I'll mention a few. You don't need to turn there unless you want to, but in Psalms 139, 23 through 24, David prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In Psalms 51, 9 and 10, he also prayed, Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So how is sin forgiven? How does it get wiped out? Well, we all know sin is a transgression of God's sacred law, and you can find that in John, 1 John 3 and verse 4. The penalty can be located in Romans, Romans 6, verse 23, where it says that all have sinned. Well, I better turn there and read it exactly what it says. Romans 6, 23, just a page over here. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. That's the penalty, and that penalty has to be paid. It's a cause and effect relationship that is absolute and automatic. Sin, die. Simple as that. And just to illustrate, and we've probably all heard this a million times before, but it, it just works. Gravity. Step off a 10-story building, and gravity doesn't get happy. It doesn't get excited. It doesn't say, oh, this is going to be fun. It just happens, doesn't it? You step off a building, 10-story building, and you're going to go to the bottom, and there's going to be consequences. And I'm not sure if you'd be fortunate if, there, if you survived or not, because you'd be pretty broken up. But that's the consequences of breaking the law of gravity. And in a similar way, breaking God's law brings about a similar penalty, death. Forgiveness is not... It's not something that eliminates the penalty for the sin. That penalty still needs to be paid. Forgiveness is actually a transfer of the penalty to somebody or something else to pay the penalty in our place. And so the question is, and you're all already there, I know this, but the question is who pays the penalty? Well, Jesus Christ does. All have sinned and death penalty hangs over everyone. So God knew a savior was needed. A Savior was needed to die for the sins of the world, for our sins, for each of us. As Peter says in 1 Peter 1, in verses 18 through 20, the NIV perhaps puts it very clearly, where it states, For you know that it is not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Also in 1 John 2, verse 2, the Apostle John says, talks about God's great love for us and, for the, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, where he says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. That penalty had to be paid. That penalty of sin must be paid. And he was willing to pay it. And as it says in 1 John 4, 9 through 10, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is an incredible truth. And it's restated in John three sixteen, And we've all heard this before, but it's... It's amazing, and we need to understand it. We need to internalize it, That where it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. Freedom from sin. It's just amazing that God loved us while we were still sinners, while we were still disgusting and 
buried in abominations, the abominations of our sins. He, he loved us and reached out to us and provided for us. We were under a death penalty, and he called, reached out to us with conversion. As it says in Hebrews 12, too, that we should be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If you look at Psalms 22, you can see some of the feelings that Christ experienced as, and the anguish he felt as he was enduring his betrayal and death. And Galatians 3.13 tells us that he willingly accepted that curse. The death penalty for all of us, the one that was required of us, would have been required of us if he hadn't taken it on himself. Where it says he's became a curse for us. Christ's sacrifice was so complete that no sin ever committed bigger is too big or too small for God to forgive us. Paul spoke of himself as the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 1. And yet look how powerful he used Paul after his conversion. King David saw God's mercy as endless, filling the earth. You can read that in Psalms 119 and verse 64. <clears throat> the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is central to the, to the Bible's message of salvation. The fact that our penalty can be paid, that our guilt can be washed away. Now, out in the world and the Christianity out there, they ignore all that. It's a kind of a feel-good, you know, if you feel good about yourself, then they've figured it all out. You know, that's how, that's how they want it to be. You just need to feel good about yourself and not feel too bad about anything at all. Everything is fine. But we know that in order to understand the forgiveness that God gives us, to appreciate that, that forgiveness, to have it applied to us, that sacrifice applied to our penalty, that we need to be convicted of the fact that we have been living wrong or that we have been doing wrong, that we've done, that we have sinned. And then we had to reach out to God so that we could be provided a new conscience, a clean conscience, and a new way of thinking. God's forgiveness allows us to experience freedom from guilty feelings and to have a relationship with God. So basically, those are the standards. The standard needs to come from God. So we need to take those old concepts of right and wrong that were programmed into us by our childhood, by our family, by society, by the religions that we once were a part of, or even here where we perhaps didn't understand completely. We need to set aside those things and look to the Bible and look to the truth of God to, as our standards to live by. Perhaps one of the best stories that we could look at to consider this is in Luke 15. And it's the parable of the prodigal son. Here's, here's a story of a young man who left home, wasted his entire inheritance on booze and wild women, had him a good time. You could probably write a couple of country songs about it, you know. Partying without any recognition of the consequences. And he ended up so hungry, so alone, that he would have eaten out of the trough with the pigs. Eee, that's pretty bad, pretty low. And he realized as he thought back on his early life, all the things that he'd lost, all the money, he'd lost his family, he'd abandoned his friends, and he'd probably worst of all, he'd abandoned his self-respect. He just, just trashed everything, just destroyed everything. And he thought, what am I going to do? You know, my, the servants of my dad eat pretty well. I'll go back there and see if I can hire on. You know, I'm not worthy of being a son, but I'll, but I'll go back and stop this. I've just got to stop doing this, and I've got to try to do things differently. And what happened? Well, he ran it, he, his father saw him, and we, you know, we all know the story, but in, in verse 21, we see his humble realization as he comes to his father. He says, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. What a humble attitude, a repentant attitude. One that recognized how terrible the things were that he did. And he had every reason to expect his father to be angry, to be wrathful, to take it out on him. But his father was thrilled. You're home. <laughs> 
You've given up on your self-destructive ways and you came home. Well, how wonderful. I'm so glad you're here. Let's have a party. And that's how God looks at each one of us. He says, hey, you've recognized what you've done wrong. That's great. Come on. It's all okay. Everything's fine. You know, we need to bury the past. We need to let go. No matter how deep the pit or how hopeless or dark life may seem, how many wrong deeds we think we've racked up on the big list, he just, we just need to admit our mistakes to God and accept his forgiveness and the blessings. Let go of the past. Bury it. God doesn't have any association when he looks at us with our old sins. He puts it all behind us. They were buried. First in our baptism and then in the, in the sacrifice of Christ. Do we need to go dig them up? Well, that would be grave robbery. Don't be a grave robber. You know, repentance is not about continuing to worry about past sins. That's penance. God doesn't expect us to beat ourselves up constantly about things we've done in the past that we've repented of, that we turned from, that he has forgiven us of. We need to let go of them. We don't need to remind him of our past sins by continuing to dwell on them, by continuing to mull them over. He wants us to trust that he has forgiven us and has forgotten those things. We should learn from the past, but we need to let go and leave it in the past. Imagine we're back on that hike and you've got your backpack full of rocks and you're looking at the past. You're walking backwards along that windy trail with those cliffs and steep drop-offs and what have you. But you're not looking ahead, you're looking behind. How long do you think it'll be before you take, before gravity takes over? Well, it's, maybe it's an imperfect analogy, but that's our lives. That's what we need to do. We need to turn around, drop the rocks and move forward. Don't be weighed down by them. Romans 6.4 says we are to walk in newness of life. If we do this, in God's eyes we're a new person. As though we had never sinned. We're clean. And it's important that we see ourselves like this and focus on the future. Perhaps one of the best summations of that thought is, can be found in Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14. One thing I do... Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We have to realize how complete the forgiveness is that is possible through Christ's perfect sacrifice. We need to look ahead and maintain that right course. Not walk backwards, but look ahead. Don't try to defy gravity. Certainly, we, as we conclude this message, we need to ask God for help in turning our life around. If you're struggling with guilty feelings, ask God to help you understand what you should really feel guilty about. And then ask for his forgiveness to remove the burden of that guilt. Christ proclaimed, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your lives. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's from Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. The Apostle Paul perhaps captured what it really means to be a Christian when he wrote in Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you want to go through your life living by the standards of it, you know, it feels good, do it, well then maybe you shouldn't be hearing this message. But if you're sick and tired of making the same mistakes, your life can change. If you long for deep spiritual fulfillment, then God wants to transform your life. And he can transform our lives. We just need to go home and take our place as his child. And he's just waiting for us to start heading towards him.